to the um, Hill County Historical Society. This is a uh, quarterly speaker presentation uh, sponsored by our activities and events committee. Uh, we're pretty stoked tonight uh, about this speaker. Uh, my name is Dave Rucker, uh, Yamhill County since 1966. Uh, I see a lot of other Yamhill County faces. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, we have wine and snacks over here, other beverages as well. Restrooms are right over there, if you didn't know. Uh, so partake as needed. Uh, I have a written bio here uh, for our speaker. Uh, and we'll hope that it's accurate. <laughs> Come up and tell me if it's not, I'll bet. Uh, a fifth generation Oregonian, Bill Sullivan began hiking at the age of five. He's the author of 23 books, many of which are related to hiking in Oregon specifically. His vast knowledge of nature and hiking trails was reinforced when in 1985, he set out to investigate Oregon's wilderness on a 1,361 mile solo backpacking trek from what the westernmost shore at Cape Blanco to the easternmost point in Hell's Canyon. His journal of that two month adventure was published as the acclaimed book called Listening for Coyote, which I believe you will find in the library back there. He and his wife Janelle live in Eugene, but they spend summers in a log cabin they built by hand on a roadless stretch of a remote river in Oregon's coast range. He wrote the memoir called Cabin Fever, Notes from a Part-Time Pioneer, to tell the humorous and dramatic story of the 25 summers they spent building the cabin. When Bill's not hiking or backcountry ski touring, he can be found playing the pipe organ or harpsichord, reading foreign novel or language novels, and promoting libraries. Today's slideshow is taken from his book, Exploring Oregon's Hips History. That's Exploring Oregon's History. You can catch that which describes the history behind 57 different scenic sites along trails in Oregon, including nearby Shampooey Park. Uh, this book, which I don't have, it looks like that, uh, is for sale along with many others up at that desk for 20 bucks. I hear Bill will even sign that for us. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Bill Sullivan. Well, thanks for the thorough introduction. It saves me a lot of time. <laughs> I am a fifth generation Oregonian. My father was the editor of the Salem Statesman Journal back when it was a real paper. And, but I'm actually writing features for the Gannett's uh, papers in Salem and Eugene now. Um, but that's not what I mostly do. I, I go hiking all summer and then I've got all winter to write. And so I write, I write uh, a lot about Oregon history and a lot about uh, oh, historical novels, murder mysteries, all kinds of things. And I thought I'd start. Today, I want to take you on a tour of 14,000 years of Oregon history in one hour. So we're going to cover a lot of ground there. But I want to start by telling you a little bit more about myself. I wonder if it's possible to turn out the lights in the front of the room here. Um, this was the book he mentioned about this thousand mile hike I took across Oregon. I wanted to visit all of the wilderness areas and naively thought the easy way to do this would be to walk through them all at once. So, so I went from the westernmost point of the state, alone with a backpack, to the easternmost point in two months. And along the way, I kept this journal of all my adventures. So down here is where I was held at gunpoint by marijuana growers. And up here, I poisoned myself with mushrooms, another bright idea when you're alone in the woods. And I wound up hiking 40 miles a day through Hell's Canyon, trying to outrun these October snowstorms. To this day, it amazes me that people read this book and it makes them want to go. I... Uh, and the other adventure memoir is the one that he mentioned about this log cabin that we built by hand using only pioneer tools, partly to prove you could do it the pioneer way and partly because we were broke at the time. So the whole house cost $400 to build. There is no road. You have to hike in a mile and a half, even now. Uh, there's no cell phone service. 
clearly. So uh, I, I write my novels out there with a typewriter. And then I have hiked every trail I could find in the state and then written guidebooks about them. But the last two years, three years, there have been so many fires and so many changes that I had to redo the whole series. So I have a whole new version of the local guidebook for the Oregon Coast and Coast Range and for Portland. And it tells you which trails burned up. There are 50 of them that burn and uh, more than 20 that require advanced permits. So all of that has changed quite a bit. Uh, and then other books that cover all of Oregon. I might note the one on the lower right is a five pound, $50 color picture book. I wrote the text for it, but they hired a real photographer. I told them where to go to get beautiful pictures of, of, in, in the Northwest. And uh, that one is uh, just came out. I, I could get it at an author's discount so I can sell it for 30. And the other books are mostly $20, but uh, if you buy one, any other book you want is $10. Uh, I, this is just a benefit. Or, I don't know. My wife wants me to clear off my shelves. <laughs> <laughs> and this is a series of murder mysteries I did. Uh, some parts of Oregon history were so weird, I thought they didn't fit into a regular history book. They cried out for a murder. And that would be D.B. Cooper and the Rajneeshis. So uh, D.B. Cooper, if he is alive, He'd be in his 80s now. So in this novel, I have him living in Portland in plain sight. And he's, uh, but he's changed his name, of course. But uh, he, uh, he finds out that he's being blackmailed and it winds up involving the Russian mafia and voodoo donuts. <laughs> <laughs> so my wife is Danish and we speak the language. So we've, uh, I've been translating the sagas about Viking burial ships. And each of these is based on the actual excavation of a real Viking ship. This one found in Norway in 1904. Turns out many of the people involved in these ships were women. So that's a large part of the story. I alternate chapters between the uh, Vikings a thousand years ago and then the excavations of the ships in modern times. Uh, and I've narrated all these books as audio books too. If you, want, if you have 10 hours to kill, you're driving to Steen's Mountain or something, uh, there's no radio reception out there. You can listen to me tell one of these stories. So now we're going to do 14,000 years of Oregon history in 55 minutes. And uh, what was Oregon like 14,000 years ago? Well, that was the end of the Ice Age. So the Ice Age brought snow and ice to Canada and the mountains, but to Eastern Oregon, it brought rain. So instead of a desert, it was a savanna with big lakes. And these lakes have mostly dried up. But here you can see the remnants of them. This is at Hart Mountain. Those alkali pools down there, those are the Warner Lakes. But halfway up the cliff, you see what looks like a bathtub rim. Uh, that is how high the lakes were in the Ice Age. They were 200 feet higher. And they stretched all the way to Fort Rock, where the first evidence of humans in really all of North America has been found. And I put 7,000 BC there because that's in the 1930s, they discovered the, the sandals there that were underneath a layer of Mount Mazama ash. And this was before they had carbon dating. Um, and so they, they, but they knew that Mount Mazama blew up 7,000 years ago. So it proved that people were here that long ago, which was seven times longer than they thought at that point. But now they found in a cave nearby, a Paisley Caves, uh, DNA that proved people have been in Oregon for 14,300 years. So it wasn't it, at Four Rock just two sandals. It was 70 sagebrush sandals, all different sizes. This is like a Nike superstore from the Stone Age. Uh, they're not even quite sure why there were so many of those sandals there. Fort Rock is an amazing place to visit. Uh, in any case, but it was originally a cinder cone. It, 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 was, it had the sloped sides of a cinder cone. The reason it looks like a fortress in the desert is that it, it erupted in the lake and the surf of the lake wore away the sides to a ring and then breached the ring on one side, leaving this semicircle out in the desert. If that seems hard to believe, Go around, walk around the outside, you'll find the bathtub ring where the surf has carved a notch 
all the way around Fort Rock. That surf also undercut layers of soft rock in many places and left these overhangs. Now they call it Fort Rock Cave, but it really is just an overhang where the surf cut back uh, an, an opening. And it's really not in Fort Rock at all, but rather over here in Fort Rock Cave a few miles away, but that's surrounded by private land and you have to have a special uh, permit to go there. Uh, so I recommend walking around Fort Rock and looking at the cave from a distance. This is a good time to go. You might wait a week for the snow to melt, but in spring, the Oregon sunshine, the flowers bloom, uh, and you get to this view over to that knoll over there. And in the uh, 14,000 years ago, that was a peninsula at the edge of this 75 mile wide lake. It was a great place to live if you were here in Oregon <laughs> at that time, because you had there were camels and bison that would come down to the lake to drink all these fish and waterfowl, and you had a shelter. Uh, the same people who lived there spent their summers at Paulina Lake, and they found their summer ca uh, camp up there where they'd collect huckleberries and deer. So those are the first people in Oregon. Uh, by the way, they know that this people are uh, from 14,300 years ago and that they were human because what they found were coprolites. Do you know what coprolites are? How many hands? Few? Yeah, they are dried human feces. And you think, big deal, they found an old turd. <laughs> but but you're, they were, were able to take DNA on it, prove it was human. And then the, uh, and that also showed that the, the people who were in Oregon at that time, that their ancestors came from Siberia. This is the first proof of the Alaska land bridge theory. And the descendants of those people are still here. They are the Indians of Oregon and North and South America. They spread out from here to populate two continents. All right, now we're gonna switch to uh, a little bit of geology, but this is the uh, 15 ton the largest meteorite ever land intact. And uh, the reason I'm gonna bring it up here is because <clears throat> it uh, arrived in Oregon 12,000 years ago, and when it did, it killed half the people in the state. That seems a little hard to believe, but let me explain. Because the Willamette meteorite was found near West Lynn, but it didn't land there. It landed 12,000 years ago in the Ice Age. And there are two different books I got. The one on the left is the one I'm mostly going to be talking about, but the one on the right is Oregon's geology and natural history, and that's where this story is coming from. Uh, so 12,000 years ago, Canada was covered by a mile of ice, a continental glacier. The meteorite landed there and had a soft landing. Most meteorites blow up, disintegrate, and melt when they hit, but this one landed and left a crater in the ice that is, of course, no longer there. But the glacier moves. And so the glacier gradually rafted this uh, rock from outer space down to northern Idaho. And a, a lobe of the glacier pinched off a branch of the Columbia River. Uh, and the whole Clark Fork was backed up into Montana in what we can now call Glacial Lake Missoula. It was a huge lake. It had about the volume of Lake Erie, but the dam was made out of ice and ice floats. So every 80 years or so, when the lake got 800 feet deep, it would float the dam. And within one or two days, all of the water in that lake would rush across Eastern Washington, roar down the Columbia Gorge 800 feet deep at 60 miles an hour, and back up at Portland because of the hills there and uh, back all the way up to fill the Willamette Valley 300 feet deep all the way to Eugene. Now you can prove this yourself on your drive home. Two miles west of here, right off the highway is Glacial Erratic State Wayside. Probably all of you have been there, right? Yeah, everybody goes there. Well, that is uh, a rock that is that came on one of the icebergs from that flood. There were actually many floods every 80 years. 
And we know that it didn't come from Oregon because it's made out of argillite. Argillite is a kind of slate that is unknown in Oregon, but common in the Canadian Rockies. So it came from Canada on an iceberg. There were lots of icebergs and uh, they, they left glacial erratics like this all around the Willamette Valley where the icebergs melted as the water went down. And one of those icebergs was at West Lynn. And we know that too, because there were a bunch of granite rocks from the Canadian Rockies right around this giant meteorite, a 15 ton, looks like a peach pit. Uh, it didn't always look that way. This meteor is 95% iron. So everything that was above the ground level rusted away and left rusty pools on the surface of the ground. And the, uh, the native tribes here, the Kalapuyas, the Mount Multnomahs, knew about this rock. And they called it a Tamanawas stone, a power stone. They would dip arrowheads in it to, uh, the pools to give them power. But then it was discovered by a farmer in 1902 who hit it with an ax and it rang like a bell. And he dragged it off to the, the Lewis and Clark Exposition in Portland in 1904, showed it off. Everyone wanted to know exactly where he'd found it. And it turns out he found it on his neighbor's property. Ah, so there was a big lawsuit and blah, blah, blah. It wound up, a, a woman bought it and, and donated it to the Museum of Natural History in New York City, where it resides to this day as the prime exhibit. Mostly, and I say mostly, because the museum in New York really wanted a Martian meteorite. Now these are extremely rare on earth. They're called tektites. And the guy who had one for sale said he wouldn't take money for it, but he would be willing to trade for a piece of the Willamette meteorite. And so the museum in New York sawed off a 17 pound chunk of the Willamette meteorite and traded for this tektite. When the Grand Ronde tribe in Oregon heard about this, they hit the roof. They said, under the, under the uh, uh, native laws, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a, an act of Congress that says that sacred native objects have to be returned to the tribe. We want the rock back if you're going to start sawing it up. The museum in New York backpedaled furiously. They said, we're so sorry. Uh, we'll fly you out to New York the, uh, and let you do your dances, close the museum for a day, whatever. Just please let us keep this rock. It's our best exhibit. <laughs> and so they settled, mostly, because 17 pounds of that rock is put out there. And about 15 years ago, whoever owned it put an anonymous ad in the Oregonian, a full page ad, offering it for sale for $2 million. And the target really was the Grand Ronde tribe. He wanted them to buy it back. And the tribe responded, we do not respond to extortion. We think no one should be buying or selling sacred objects that belong to the tribe. We don't want anyone to bid on this rock. And so no one did. And now we have uh, replicas of the Willamette meteorite, one in West Lynn and one in Eugene at the Museum of Natural History in, at the University of Oregon. But the real mystery is this rock came from outer space. It didn't land in Oregon, but it wound up here. And as it came, the flood killed half the people in the state because it, anybody living along the Columbia River or in the Willamette Valley would have been killed. And now part of it's So I think it's one of, the, it's a great, one of the great mystery of Oregon and uh, a lesson about maybe high ground in a flood. <laughs> so the Bridge of the Gods is, another, is a, a Native American legend about a, a bridge across the Columbia River where you could walk dry footed across the river. And oh, the early pioneers laughed at this because an engineer will tell you it is not physically possible to build a stone arch a mile long across a river. That cannot happen. And yet, people have been walking on the ruins of the Bridge of the Gods for years. So let me tell you the legend, and then you can decide for yourself whether you think there's truth to it. The legend says that the great spirit, uh, Tai Saheli, um, when he started populating the world with people, he put the Klingatats, 
in the north and the Multnomah tribe to the south and put this river between them so that they wouldn't fight too much. But then decided he should have, they should have a bridge of peace, a way to a little bit. So he made a way to cross the river dry footed uh, so that they could mm, communicate. And then an evil god demon turned up. There were a lot of them back then. This one was named Luwit, and she uh, sat right in the middle of the bridge of the gods, transformed herself into a beautiful maiden, and drove the chiefs of the two tribes wild with jealousy. They started a big war, and the uh, great spirit was so upset by the whole thing that he uh, destroyed the bridge and turned the principal characters into mountains. So Luwit, the evil demon who is beautiful but violent, was turned in the, into the beautiful but violent Mount St. Helens. I think her true nature has emerged. And the chief of the Multnomah tribe, whose name was Y East, was turned into Mount Hood. Its native name is still Y East. And the chief of the Klickitat tribe was turned into Mount Adams in the background there in the back. But if you look at the Columbia River here, at the modern Bridge of the Gods, that's this um, bridge up there, you see that the river bends toward the Oregon shore. Uh, that bend was not there 700 years ago. And on the Table Rock, this mountain at the top up here, you see a fresh looking scarf uh, on the edge. That's where a landslide uh, came off that mountain and pushed the river toward the Oregon side and dammed the entire river for as much as two months, 700 years ago. And during that time, it was possible to walk across the Columbia River dry footed. It backed up the river all the way to the Dalles. When it washed out, it left a rapids called the Cascades. And that rapids gave the name to the entire Cascade Range. But the Pacific Crest Trail now crosses the ruins of this bridge of the gods. It wasn't a bridge, it was a dam. The Native American tribes did not have, they didn't build bridges, they didn't have a word for bridge, they just had a word for crossing dry footed. And it was the pioneers who misinterpreted that as a, an arch. So if you hike today on the Pacific Crest Trail through there, you'll see these huge boulders all through the woods. That's remnants of the landslide that uh, as now the forest has regrown and not only trees, but uh, lots of tiger lilies, and, and uh, uh, this is a pathfinder plant. Uh, it might grow in your backyard. It's uh, uh, one that the natives call pathfinder because um, the underside of the leaves are this bright silver and they're arrow shaped. So if a tenderfoot is walking through the woods, he'll leave a trail of silver arrows pointing the way he went. Uh, at, well, after a few miles, you get to Gillette Lake, and here you have a, a view of the whole of the ruins of the Bridge of the Gods, a legend that turns out to have a solid base in geologic fact. Well, the first explorers to cross Oregon were Lewis and Clark. They chose the most difficult route possible across the Rocky Mountains through Idaho and Montana, and then canoed uh, down the Columbia River and set up camp near Astoria at uh, Fort uh, Clatsop. This is a reconstruction at the site there, about seven miles south of Astoria. They complained about Oregon. They said it rained all but 12 days that they were here. They also complained about the food. The, the Clark was the medical officer of the expedition. Lewis was actually in charge. But, uh, Clark was second in command, but he was the medical officer. And he said that the two things that were lacking in their diet in Oregon were salt and fat. Now, can you imagine a doctor today telling you that you really need more salt and fat? But if you're hiking thousands of miles, you do. So uh, he, he proposed hiking seven miles over to the ocean to boil down seawater for salt. And Clark said, I mean, Lewis said, yeah, please go. You're driving me nuts. You've got cabin fever. So. Uh, Clark went over to the to Seaside and unfortunately got there before the bed and breakfast had opened. <laughs> but they have a little city park there that has a replica of the uh, ovens where they boiled down. It got about a quart of salt a day. 
And while he was there, though, he heard a rumor from the Tillamook tribe that was there that a whale had beached on the other side of Tillamook Head, this thousand foot high headland. And they said, yeah, if you go across that, you'll find a whale on the other side. And Clint thought a whale would have blubber that we could render down for fat. And then we'd have the salt and the fat that we need to, I don't know what, make french fries, something. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he asked permission again to hike across this. And Lewis said, yes, go and please take Sacagawea too. She's from Idaho. She's never seen the ocean before or a whale. She's going to kill me if she doesn't get to go. So Clark, Sacagawea, and nine men hiked across Tillamook Head looking for a whale. That route has hardly changed in 200 years. It is now the Oregon Coast Trail across uh, Ecola State Park. And the views at this point, there's a little sign that says Clark's point of view uh, on that trail. It's thought this might be the spot that inspired Clark to write in his journal, I beheld here the grandest and most pleasing prospect that my eyes had ever perceived. High praise coming from him. He'd seen a lot of country. When they got to Cannon Beach, they found a whale, but it was entirely surrounded by Indians who were cutting it up for their own purposes and didn't want to share. So they had to bargain really hard to get 300 pounds of oil and then left Oregon basically as fast as they could. Uh, and there, the uh, story that they told about coming to Oregon made people think, oh, you could never get a wagon there. But then it turns out there was an easier pass across the Rocky Mountains in Wyoming where you could take a wagon. And, and starting in 1840 with Joe Mead, and uh, he dragged his Indian family all the way from Wyoming to the Columbia River, that just opened the floodgates. At that point, there was free government land in Oregon. The Oregon Trail was open after all. And I'm not gonna talk about the Oregon Trail here. I want to talk about not the people who are coming to Oregon on these trails, but the people who are trying to get out. And that would be uh, that would be at McKinsey Pass, the uh, Scott Trail. And this was built in 1862. McKinsey Pass, you know, between Bend and Eugene, uh, that high old pass full of lava and stuff. Uh, in 1862, the Willamette Valley had been settled up for 20 years. The farmers here had tons of food, but not much gold. And in 1862, gold had been discovered in John Day in Eastern Oregon. There were 10,000 miners over there who had tons of gold and no food. So Captain Felix Scott in Eugene got the idea. He would take a wagon load of uh, 400 head of cattle and 27 wagons and make a road going from Eugene over the mountains to Bend and then to John A. Get rid selling his food over there. It turned out to be really hard. Uh, you're going up the McKinsey Valley, there's huge rivers, trees, but then you get to the pass and there's five miles of lava. No way is he going to get 400 head of cattle across that. He looks around and finally picks the, the quickest way across the lava, uh, where it's only 100 yards wide, the lava flow. Um, it's, they named Scott Lake for him up there, and the Scott Trail was then the route that he, he pioneered across, but it's a thousand feet higher than McKinsey Pass. And you, it's now a hiking trail rather than a wagon road. You get nice views of this, of the Three Sisters and the lava flows there, and, and where it crosses the Pacific Crest Trail, there's a lovely meadow full of wildflowers. But one of the people he hired to build this trail in 1862 was named John Templeton Craig. And he said, you're building the road in the wrong spot. You should have built it a thousand feet lower at McKinsey Pass through the lava. I know it'd be harder, but that this is going to be closed by snow up here. So 10 years later, John Templeton Craig came back and built that road with a pick and a shovel through the lava. It was not easy. And now it's paralleled by the McKinsey Pass Highway, but you can still see large sections of it that look really just exactly the way they were when he finished it in 1872. Uh, but then in 1877, he, uh, he, he made a second mistake. <laughs> the first mistake 
was to bid on the contract to carry mail across the pass. He bragged that he could keep this road open all year round. And so he bid on the contract to carry mail from uh, McKinsey Bridge to Sisters across the pass all year. He won the contract, but then had to do it. He wound up doing it on skis because there's 10, 15 feet of snow up there in winter. He built a cabin up at the top of the pass. This isn't it. This is the Hand Lake Shelter, but it's only a mile from where he built his cabin and probably was a lot like that. Um, and he did that and carried the mail on skis uh, all winter for years until 1877 when he set out just before Christmas and was never seen alive again. They set up a rescue party. It was turned back by storms. Finally, in spring, they got up there and found him frozen to death in his cabin beside his sack of mail, which I guess is one example of where snow and sleet really did stop the mail from getting through. <laughs> but the determination of this diehard skiing mailman has inspired generations of Oregonians. Since 1930, the Oregon Nordic Club has held a John Templeton Craig Memorial Ski Race across McKinsey Pass, 18 miles from one snow gate to the other. They're still doing it uh, this, uh, I think in another couple Sundays. You can join them if they want, if you want. Uh, you don't have to do the whole thing. They have snowmobiles that, that uh, bring coffee to you along the way. And many of the skiers who do this carry mail with them. Uh, in memory of John Templeton Craig, the sister's post office has a special hand cancellation stamp that it can only be used on mail that has been carried over the pass on skis. Well, now let's go to the Oregon coast, and the Oregon coast has no natural harbors. There's no San Francisco Bay. There's no Puget Sound. Uh, so there were a lot of shipwrecks, and Congress authorized money to build 12 lighthouses along the length of the Oregon coast in the 1860s. Um, and if there was only money for 12 lighthouses, why is it that Newport got two of them? And the answer, of course, is that there was a government mix-up. Um, they will argue this point in Newport, but um, the first lighthouse that they built is the Aquina Bay Lighthouse, and it's built right where you think it should be, at the mouth of Aquina Bay. Notice they built the lighthouse uh, tower right on the building where the lighthouse keeper lives. It was very convenient. He could just go up from his bedroom and uh, trim the wings. But it was only used for three years because they built the other, other lighthouse too close. Well, all right, this, this is a sand castle on the beach right below the Aquina Bay Lighthouse. But on the horizon at the back, you can see the Aquina Head Lighthouse that is only three air miles away from the first lighthouse. It is the tallest in Oregon. And when they built it and, and turned it on, its light was confusing to mariners. So they shut down the first one. Why was it built here? Well, the actual name of this lighthouse is the Cape Foulweather Lighthouse. It was supposed to go 10 miles north at Cape Foulweather. But when the parts for the, for the lighthouse arrived in Newport, a local army captain said, you can't build it at Cape Foulweather. The, the weather's too foul. Let's go right out here on this headland where we get our wagons out. It'll be much easier. But then it made the other lighthouse redundant, useless, and confusing. It, uh, so you can visit either of these lighthouses if you want. Um, you might also visit the most photographed lighthouse in Oregon at Hasita Head, uh, north of Florence. And this one uh, has two ways to get there. The, the, uh, the state park there was originally called the Devil's Elbow State Park because when they brought the ship with all the lighthouse parts, it tried to land on the beach right there um, uh, below the headland and couldn't because there was a devilish current in this elbow of the ocean. They called it the devil's elbow. They had to unload in Florence and drag all the parts over there. Well, about 20 years ago, the name of the state park was changed by uh, bureaucrats in Salem, but the state park department who wanted to eliminate satanic references from Oregon state park names. So the name they chose instead is the Hasita Head Lighthouse State Scenic Viewpoint Wayside. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I prefer the old name. Uh, well, now Lighthouse is an example of uh, a marvel of engineering from the days before electric, electric motors, electric motors or electric lights. How do you get a beam that casts a light 20 miles out to sea and rotates without electricity? Well, the, uh, they do it with just a kerosene wick originally, uh, but they needed a lens that could refract the light with a thousand prisms hand ground in Paris, designed by a physicist named Fresnel. And so these Fresnel lenses could take the light from a single kerosene wick and throw it in a beam 20 miles out to sea. But the apparatus weighs half a ton. How do you make that turn? They used a cuckoo clock mechanism. You know how when you wind up a cuckoo clock, the weights go up and as they slowly go down, they turn the uh, hands of the clock and the gears. Well, there's a mechanism like that inside this tower. And every four hours, the, the lighthouse keeper or one of his two assistants would have to crank up the weights and slowly let them go down. And the beam then would flash around uh, 20 miles out to sea and rotate. That it, it's, it, I think, amazing. It's still in operation. They use an electric light but the bearings are still intact. You can stay in the lighthouse keeper's house next door. I would counsel against staying in the room that I stayed in right up there, which faces the lighthouse. <laughs> because every 12 seconds all night, this gigantic light bursts in your bedroom. And even with the blinds drawn, it's it's like having a flash bulb go off in your face. The woman before me wrote in the guest log, I felt like I was at a Hollywood premiere all night. <laughs> it's not cheap either, but people go there because of the ghost. Um, there, every lighthouse in Oregon is haunted. Some of the ghosts have better pedigrees than others. Uh, this one is a ghost named Rue, and she dates to the 1960s when this building was being used uh, for summer, summer seminars for students from the University of Oregon. And there are about 20 college kids there, poorly supervised, who are smoking dope and playing with a Ouija board. This is all true. And the Ouija board spelled out R-U-E. They decided this was the voice of the ghost trying to talk to them. Since then, people claim to have seen this woman with a long flowing gown going around. And if doors wind up being unlocked, things are misplaced, it's not the fault of the bed and breakfast owners. It's the ghost. So I don't know. You might go there anyway. If you want to go to one of the oldest lighthouses in Oregon, you might go to the one in Bandon, the Coquille River Lighthouse. It was built right on the rock that they didn't want ships to hit. And as a result, it is the only Oregon lighthouse that has been struck by a ship. <laughs> The lighthouse with the most ghosts per square inch, however, has got to be the Tillamook Rock Lighthouse. This is one mile off the shore of Tillamook Head. You remember that headland where Lewis and Clark went looking for a whale? Well, uh, originally the Coast Guard wanted to build the lighthouse on the headland itself, but the locals said it's a thousand feet high. Uh, it's often foggy here your light would be above the fog. No one will see it. You have to build it down low where the ships will see it. Well, the only place down low was this mile uh, island a mile offshore. It was a difficult place to build a lighthouse. The first surveyor that they landed on the island in a dory was immediately swept away by a wave and drowned. It took a while to hire another surveyor. <laughs> When they did, they came up with a different way of getting crews to the island. It's called a breaches buoy system. And what he did was he rigged up a, uh, a, uh, a cable that would stretch from the ship 100 yards over to the island. And then they would, uh, the workers would wear this heavy uniform suit with pulleys attached to the shoulder. They'd hang them on the cable and send them zinging over to the island. Nobody actually died using this system. 
but it wasn't all that popular with the workers either, because as, as the ship went up and down with the waves, they would alternately be dragged to the surf or snapped in the air as if by a rubber band. When they finally got to the lighthouse, to the island, it took six months to dynamite a flat spot to build anything, another six months to build the, the light itself. And when they finished the lantern, uh, beacon is 144 feet above sea level. And the engineers said that'll be plenty high. But then almost every winter, gigantic waves of the North Pacific would break over the island, smash the glass of the lantern room and hurl rocks, seaweed, and even fish into the lantern room. And of course, this is when the light needed to be burning the most, is during these storms. It became the most feared outpost in the whole of the Coast Guard. They called it terrible Tilly. Finally, a, uh, a storm in the 1930s uh, smashed the Fresnel lens. And at that point, the Coast Guard gave up, replaced the whole thing with a whistling buoy nearby. And then in 1953, they decided we don't need the island anymore. It's surplus government property. So they put it up for sale at an auction. The high bidder at first was the owner of a Las Vegas casino who thought he'd turn it into a casino until he found out you can only get there by helicopter. Not going to be get big crowds. It later was sold to Eternity at Sea, a funeral business that catered to the needs of people who want to be buried on the lighthouse when they die. For $3,000, they said, they would take an urn with your ashes, fly it out there, and put it on the island. The problem was there was no way to check if they were really doing this. And so finally, about 10 years ago, the state mortuary board, there is such a thing in state, hired a helicopter and went out to sea. They found that, yeah, the urns were there, but they were covered with eight inches of guano, bird droppings. This did not meet their, their rugged standards, rigid standards for mortuaries. So they shut the whole thing down. It is for sale again. If you want, you can buy this island, and they're still marketing it as a, an opportunity for somebody who's in the funeral business. So I don't know. I think that the real story here is that every Oregon lighthouse is haunted, but this one has more ghosts than any of the others. <laughs> so the end of the, uh, the turn of the last century, the 1900s, ushered in an era of real prosperity in Oregon. Seems like money could buy anything. All the really nice houses in McMinnville, Salem, even Portland, were built between 1915 and 1927, 1929, the crash. Um, the Piddock Mansion, 1915 in Portland, fabulous thing. It was built by the editor of the Oregonian, back when writing newspapers actually paid. Uh, but one thing they couldn't build were cabins on the coast because there was no road to the Oregon coast, no railroad yet, and no harbors. What do you do? Well, a, in 1906, a real estate developer from Kansas City named T.B. Potter bought the Tillamook Spit. This is the peninsula between Tillamook Bay and the ocean, big sandy area, and announced he was going to build the queen resort of the uh, Pacific coast there, Bay Ocean. It would rival um, Atlantic City in New Jersey. And uh, he, he, the way he'd get people there, he said, and, he, and it worked. He bought a steamship, a beautiful white steamship that sailed once a week from Portland past Astoria and would cross the bar there and dock inside and let people off. They, the, the town grew uh, to be one of the third largest city on the Oregon coast. This uh, building there was the natatorium. It's a swimming pool with heated water and a wave machine and a band shell in it. Uh, there were two hotels. Uh, this is a dance hall here in front. The problem though was access because if the weather was at all bad, that ship could not get across the bar at the mouth of Tillamook Bay and instead would have to anchor out there and shuttle people through the surf in dories. Mm, not your nice way to start your vacation. The town fathers at this point, 1917 or so, said what we really need to make this town take off is to build a jetty 
at the mouth of the bay, and then the ship can get in and dock in all weather. Well, they didn't know how right they were about making the town take off, because when they built the jetty, it changed the ocean currents and washed the entire city away. <laughs> street by street, Bay Ocean fell into the sea. The Army Corps of Engineers said, we told you, if you only build one jetty, it'll change the ocean currents. You have to build two. You were just too cheap. You only built one. And so uh, every single building in Bay Ocean vanished into the sea. This here is a bit of a fishing boat. It's not related to the town. You can now walk the uh, through the, well, finally the Army Corps of Engineers built the second jetty and the sand all returned, cleansed of its city. Uh, and so now you can walk through the town site of Bay Ocean. There's a little sign there. You can, can't tell Main Street from any other part of the dunes, uh, but it's kind of a little bit of a lesson about building your house on sand, maybe. So uh, at the start of this century, that was when the national forests were uh, begun in 1905 or so. And the, one of the first things they did was start building fire lookouts. And uh, the oldest fire lookout still left in Oregon is here on Black Butte. It was built in 1926, but it was modeled after the very first fire lookout in the country, which was built in Oregon in 1916 and looked exactly like this, but it was somewhere else. Does anybody know where the first fire lookout in 1916 was built. Shout it out if you know. Think high, think very high. Mount Hood is right. They had to backpack that uh, board by board up to the summit of Mount Hood. <laughs> and that uh, building just like this stood there until 1940 when it blew off in a winter storm and it became part of the Elliott Glacier. Uh, but Black Butte has kind of become a, a museum of fire lookouts. Uh, so you can hike up to the top. And this one uh, survived up, it was built in 1930 and lasted until about 15 years ago when it collapsed in, a, in the snow. Um, but the fire lookouts had kind of gone out of fashion for watching for fires. They use airplanes now and satellites and stuff. Um, the one at Black Butte though, they still staff. And that's because it's um, in a really great location. Mount Hood was too high. It was above the clouds. They couldn't see the forest a lot of the time. Black Butte has much better weather uh, right near you know, uh, Black Butte Ranch and Sisters there in Central Oregon. And uh, the, the forests do tend to burn in that area. So they still staff this relatively new tower. When this was first built, it was staffed by Carl DeMoy in the 1950s. And he got so tired of people coming up the stairs to look at the view that he posted a sign, do not climb the stairs. People kept doing it anyway. He finally nailed <laughs> shut the trap door at the top. They came up, banged it open until they could get out there. Finally, someone complained that he was pouring a yellowish liquid down the stairs. At <laughs> they took Carl DeMoy away to a different post, but it tells you that there's now a sign there that says, do not bother the lookout staff. They mean it. Don't go down. So the next, uh, this is a third to last uh, adventure here, is going to be from a different book. So far, we've been mostly from exploring Oregon's history and a little from Oregon's greatest natural disasters. But this is coming from your local hiking guide uh, that I just updated here last, uh, uh, last spring. But it's... Uh, it covers the trails around McMinnville, so it had Miller Woods and the Trappist Abbey and the new Chehalem Ridge uh, Metro Park up uh, toward Hillsboro, Jackson Bottom, but uh, many others too. And one of them is one of these railroad grades in the Coast Range that has just been turned into a hiking trail. Now, a hundred years ago, the Oregon Coast Range from McMinnville to Astoria was riddled with logging railroads. And they gradually, some of them are being saved under the Rails to Trails program that, that turns the old right of way into a hiking biking trail. And this new one just opened between Scapoose and Vernonia. Uh, and it was um, the Chapman Timber Company. They, in 1920s, they built this uh, 
23 mile railroad from Vernonia over the, uh, the uh, hills there, the Nahalem Hills, down to the Columbia River uh, so that they could dump the logs into the Columbia River and then uh, raft them to sawmills. This, of course, was a terrible thing for the river because the logs, the bark in the logs releases tannin, which kills the fish. So they don't allow that anymore. Um, in the 1940s, that railroad was turned into a, uh, a haul road for log trucks. And so for the next 40 years, it was log trucks on this private uh, road that took the logs and dumped them into the river. Uh, but now, uh, they don't do that anymore, so it's now a, a hiker biker trail. And parts of it are kind of boring because it's an old railroad grade. They're actually great if you're on a horse or a mountain bike. A little slow if you're on foot, but uh, if you're on foot, I would recommend going to Chapman Landing where they dump the logs into the river and then doing the most scenic part at the top uh, of the Nahalem Divide. So uh, we've already looked at Chapman Landing. And the first oh, seven miles of the railroad grade uh, follow the highway. For, it's the, the road between Scapoose and Vernonia is a paved road. But then from Ruley Trailhead on up to the Nahalem Divide, that uh, four and a half mile section wanders away from the highway and goes through some nice old woods. So this makes a nice walk. If you want to do the whole 23 mile section, you can. Uh, it takes you all the way to Vernonia, where you can connect with the Banks Vernonia Trail, It'll take you to Hillsborough. Well, so it is a railroad grade, so never too steep. There are informative signs along the way that tell you of the pioneer history. A lot of the people who worked on the railroad and later uh, settled there were Japanese until World War II, when they were uh, trucked uh, to Eastern Oregon and beyond illegally. Uh, here's the crest of the old railroad grade. The paved highway crosses on a bridge above it now. But if you do continue all the way to Vernonia, why not keep going? Because the next 23 miles are the Banks Vernonia uh, uh, linear trail. This is a state park. And there they've, uh, they have a couple of trestles that they've made safe even for horses. This is the Buxton trestle. You can ride it unless it's a really skittish horse. You could ride it across the trestle. And so then you're going, what, 46 miles from the Columbia River almost to Hillsboro at Banks. And then, this is the, what's really interesting, then there's the 78-mile Salmonberry River Railroad, which goes all the way to Tillamook. And this is not ready yet. Uh, this is not open. It was... Um, uh, it was used as a railroad until the 1980s when a flood wiped out the uh, under the, the rails. They're still hanging in the air. Um, and that, by the way, that flood, it hasn't been used for rail, railroads. It, it trapped a train in Tillamook. And a locomotive and a whole bunch of cars, they use it as a tourist train and steam it back and forth from Garibaldi to Rockaway Beach. Uh, because it can't go anywhere else. It can't get out. Right. Well, and this part is now, there's talk to restore the whole thing as a hiker biker trail because it has 12 trestles and nine tunnels. It would be spectacular. The problem is that both the trestles and the tunnels are dangerous. Um, there's loose boards, the rocks fall from the roof. It's um, so the port of Tillamook has officially closed the whole thing. Um, but here's a little secret. The lower part of it, uh, toward the coast, the first five miles, they don't actually, there's no trespassing signs, but they don't prosecute people who hike that part. Because it's really pretty safe. So <laughs> in my book, I, I say, don't do this hike. But if you did, this is how you do it. <laughs> so you might do that first five miles there on the west side to see what it would be like. They are trying to raise $65 million to finish this uh, project, restore the trestles and the tunnels, and it would be amazing, world-class. You would be able to bicycle 
from Portland to Tillamook on a bike path or choose to go up to the Columbia River instead. It'd be amazing. And all we need is about 60 million and change. Well, the good times ended with a crash and the Great Depression, most of the banks failed. Third of the population was unemployed. Homeless camps, sound familiar? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, it was a time of despair in the cities, but a time of hope in the forests because President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, created a make work project. It was a government program to employ 2 million young, unemployed young men and put them to work in the forests, building campgrounds and trails and things. He called them his forest army. And they had to send half of their paycheck home to keep the families alive back home, all over the country. Uh, they built amazing things. Silver Falls State Park wouldn't be there without the work of these guys. And they also built Timberline Lodge. And this was a little more controversial. Um, they hired 700 unemployed artists and craftsmen, blacksmiths, weavers, uh, carpenters. Uh, they were unemployed too and put them to work here. They put their heart and soul into this building a mile high to build a five-star hotel on an apparently a desolate mountaintop. Who would go there in a depression? Um, but they carved the head of a ram here by this door. And here they did the head of a buffalo. And here's the head, well, of the, uh, of the mascot, the St. Bernard's. They have been there since the first, either a Heidi or a Bruno. They kind of alternate them. And that was to soften this uh, otherwise harsh environment and lure people up there. Who was going to go camp it? I mean, stay at a hotel in the desolate waste up there on Mount Hood. The other thing they did was to build the Timberline Trail, 40 miles around the mountain with four shelters along the way. You could hike around the mountain in five days, but you had to stay at Timberline Lodge twice. Uh -huh. It's a marketing program. The other thing they did was to build the first ski resort in North America, at least the first chip of it. And it went from Timberline Lodge up to the Silcox Hut. They called it the Magic Mile because it was one mile long. It had one chair at a time, not you know four across, just one person at a time. It took 15 minutes to get up the mile to the Silcox Hut. When they opened this in 1938, they invited the King of Norway to come here and show people what to do with these boards on your feet. <laughs> but then they modernized it and they built a more uh, a high speed quad chairlift next door. Uh, the new magic mile is over here. Uh, the Silcox hut held the turnaround machinery at the top. It was left abandoned for 50 years, a ruin with snow blowing through the roof. And then a group called the Friends of the Silcox Hut decided to restore it. They hired blacksmiths and carpenters, uh, weavers, all the people that would have built Timberline Lodge and in the same style restored this building and have now opened it to the public as an extension of Timberline Lodge. You need a group of at least 12 to rent this place, but then it's cheaper than Timberline. And when they'll not only let you rent it, They'll give you tickets on the Magic Mile. You can ride that up, or you can take a snow cat. They'll bring your suitcases up in a snow cat up there, and at no extra charge, they provide a chef who cooks for you up there. So a pretty neat place, and it has a better view than Timberline Lodge. Uh, looking out here to Mount Jefferson and the Three Sisters, and uh, yeah, a view from the the days of the recession when you had to have a long range view to see the better years ahead, except they weren't better at first because the depression ended with World War II and the forest army became a real army. And you wouldn't think that Oregon would be on the front line of World War II, but we were. And this is also not widely known, but it was the American military strategies said that after the Japanese successfully attacked the Hawaiian Islands and could bomb the heck out of that, they thought it was the, their next move might be to land an invasion army on the North American continent. If they did, the place they would do it would be Oregon. It sticks out in the ocean. The coastline is poorly defended. 
low low population, it'd be an easy place for to land an army. So they set about defending the Oregon coast. Um, already at Fort Stevens at the mouth of the Columbia, they had a fort from World War, not even from the Civil War. It had been built there to guard against Confederate warships, which never came. But um, they beefed it up and put in a gun with a, an eight mile range so that any submarine that surfaced up, any ship that dared to threaten the mouth of the Columbia, they'd blow it out of the water. And then a Japanese submarine really did surface off the mouth of the Columbia. And on its deck, it had a gun with a nine mile range. So it lobbed 27 shells at Fort Stevens and the commanders there decided not to fire back because they'd just give away their location. So the, after that, the army switched its whole strategy of defending Oregon away from gun emplacements to blimps, to dirigibles, airships. They built two of these blimp hangars in Tillamook, may not be that big, but it's the largest wooden building in the world, 17 stories tall, a quarter mile long. It housed four blimps in the war. Now it's a museum of World War II aircraft, and it's so big they can fly the planes indoors. But the blimps did not catch the same submarine when it came back with a secret weapon and attacked the southern Oregon coast successfully. This was hushed up for years. So how did they do it? Successfully target and bomb the US mainland for the first time since the War of 1812. Well, they had a secret weapon. And they were at a disadvantage because the Japanese did not have sonar or radar. We did, it was a huge advantage. Our submarines could tell where ships, where ships were without going up and looking. The Japanese couldn't do that. So their submarines each had a hangar on the deck with a disassembled airplane. And they would roll the plane out, screw on the wings, bolt on these pontoons, and then launch it off this ramp like a slingshot. And it would fly around radio back the locations of ships to torpedo. Then it would land on those pontoons and that derrick there would hoist it back on the deck. They'd unscrew the wings, unbolt the pontoons, put it back in this waterproof hangar and go around and torpedo ships. But the plane could also carry one 500 pound bomb. And the pilot, Lieutenant Nobuo Fujita, proposed to the Japanese high command after coming back from shelling Fort Stevens, he said, we should use this to attack. We should bomb, let me bomb the Panama Canal or the Seattle airport. They brought him before the Admiral of the Japanese Navy and the Prince of Japan. This Lieutenant must have been shaking in his boots, the two highest officials in the Japanese Navy. And they said, Lieutenant Fujita, we admire your courage. Your plan, however, has one flaw. Your plane is made out of plywood and canvas. It can be outflown by a fast bird. <laughs> you have no chance of penetrating the air defenses of Seattle or Panama. You'll be shot down immediately. So instead, we're going to have you target and bomb the Calmeopsis wilderness of Southern Oregon. And he goes, what? Uh, they said, well, we'll give you an incendiary bomb. The idea will be to start a forest fire. It will detract from the war effort. And he goes, like, whatever. So they come all the way back with this submarine. They launched off the ship successfully. It flies past the lookouts at, uh, uh, on the coast without being spotted. It goes toward the Kalmyopsis wilderness and drops its bomb on Wheeler Ridge. The bomb blows up. Now, you have to imagine what it would have been like to be the fire lookout on uh, Mount Emily that morning, uh, eight miles away. It was eight o'clock in the morning. He was pouring a cup of coffee. He looks out the window. Here comes a Japanese plane and drops a bomb. It blows up. He calls the Army Air Force Command Support in Roseburg and says, uh, you've been warning about this invasion of the Japanese. A plane just dropped a bomb. This could be the invasion you're talking about. Send fighters. They said, OK, what's the location of the nearest airport? He goes, well, uh, <laughs> we don't have one very near. But the nearest one is in Bend, and this is true. Coos Bay does not have its own airport. Its sister city, North Bend, has the airport. So he said, yeah, I'm located south of North Bend. 
So the Army Air Force sent a squadron of fighters to the city of Bend, Oregon. <laughs> there were no submarines. And Lieutenant Fujita escaped unscathed in his submarine. Actually, they, they, they shook it up a little bit with a, one of the death charge. Um, okay, but what happened to the bomb? I mean, it did blow up, but it blew up you know, redwood for it. So redwoods are fireproof. So it left a crater, but it just burnt, scorched a few trees, did not start a fire. Uh, more bad planning. Okay, so 40 years pass now, and the army has hushed this up all that time because they didn't want people to be frightened that the Japanese could target and bomb the mainland. Um, and they say, okay, let's build a one mile trail to this bomb crater. And for the grand opening of the trail, who better to invite than the pilot who dropped the bomb? <laughs> they found this guy. Mr. Fujita was 80 years old. Japan, and he has misgivings about this. If they come back, <laughs> he, he thought it might be a ruse to put him on trial as, a, trial as a war criminal. So he brought with him his family's 400 year old samurai sword, which he just carried on the plane as carry on luggage. You could do that back then. This razor sharp sword, and this, would you want to put that in the overhead rack or under your seat? Uh, no, I'll just keep it here with me. That's but he brought that so that if they did accuse him of war crimes, he could commit ritual suicide. But instead, he planted a redwood in the crater as an apology. And then he donated the sword to the city of Brookings, where it hangs in the public library to this day. And you know, I think all trails in Oregon are peaceful, but this one has an especially strong message of peace when you get to the end of the trail. And here's this little redwood seedling with a plaque that says, this is one of Oregon's 50 heritage trees. And I was there when kids came up and laughed, said, couldn't they have found a bigger redwood tree somewhere in Oregon? But if you know the story, then you know why that little tree was so important. And actually why so much of Oregon's history can never really be put in museums. You can have uh, amazing things in museums, uh, butter churns and wagons, and, and demonstrations of blacksmithing, but some things remain better out in the wild. Uh, the petroglyphs, the wagon train ruts, the uh, haunted lighthouses, the uh, wagon train roads, and uh, sacred sites to the tribes. Uh, in some ways, wilderness preserves these things better than even our cities. In our cities, we tear down buildings and build ones frantically all the time. You can hardly recognize uh, a picture from Portland from 50 years ago. Um, but uh, things move at a slower pace in the wilderness. So I don't know what Oregon will look like in another 14,000 years. Maybe there'll be another ice age. Maybe it's already started. But I'm thinking that in, in that future time, people will look back at us and judge us not by the things that we've built, but by the things we've left intact. And they too may have to get off, get off the beaten path a little bit to really go out and explore Oregon's history. And that's my talk. I lied, it took, it took uh, an hour and 10 minutes to tell it. That story. <laughs> During the time that we built the lodge at uh, Mount Hood, there, there was another lodge we built at Crater Lake. Was that in that program too? The Crater, Crater, Crater Lake Lodge was uh, built later, and uh, it was a sad story, really. They built a, a lousy job of it in 1915. And it was falling down by 1980. Uh, and the National Park Service wanted to tear it down. There was an outcry. They spent $30 million removing the exterior, building a modern hotel on the site, and putting the exterior back. So yeah, so it actually has plumbing now. And it looks nice, but it, uh, it's not like Timberline Lodge, where the whole thing is still authentic. Okay, thank you. Yeah. It's just as expensive. Stay <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Any other know. questions? Um, I didn't see anything about the balloon bombings in Deer Heart. The balloon bombings uh, in World War II, the Japanese also launched 10,000 balloon bombs. Uh, they were not a targeted attack, they were random. Uh, only one of them actually killed anybody, and that was near uh, Klamath Falls. It was a, a family that was out on a Sunday picnic, and so it killed mostly children. Uh, but uh, that was a, a, a sort of a desperate attempt uh, to just scatter bomb things, whereas the uh, the uh, Fujita's attack was was planned from the highest levels specifically for to target it as a specific site. Didn't they also um, drop bombs around the, the Lakeview area? I've heard stories where they found that it bombs in Bruce Reservoir. Bombs near the Lakeview area? These would be the balloon bombs. There were 10,000 of them, and they were uh, little shrapnel things. If you touch them, they blow shrapnel, and so. Uh, but uh, there, those were the only bombs, and they haven't found them all. So there's, I guess there's still a danger. Any questions? Well, yeah, and I do. Uh, the what I'm offering today is twenty dollars for the first book. Any others? Ten. So great, great. Okay, you good so sometimes y'all are very curious listening for coyote and you're just really thought, hey, wouldn't it be cool if I could maybe, you know, for a fiction hike, but to see your you know, your the fans and the trail. Yeah. And so I went went working online and said, is there some place I can find uh Google map of your route? Oh, on my right route across Oregon in nineteen eighty five. Um, I actually left the topo maps at the uh, state library in Salem. Go to the, uh, ask it, walk in the state library and ask to see the original maps, and you'll, there they are, the actual ones I took on the on the trip. Uh, but uh, nobody has actually hiked that again, <laughs> uh, and it hasn't really been developed much. It's pretty much the way it was back then. I guess that's a good thing. You don't really want everything to be developed. Yeah. You're welcome. <laughs> and I have hiked pretty much all of that in section since then, as I rehiked all the trails of Oregon for these hiking guidebooks. And I have to rehike them all the time. It's a tough job hiking for a living, you know. Um, I don't know how many miles. For a while, I was doing 10, 20,000 miles a year, and now I think it's, it's fewer. What I do is I give away a free book to the first person who emails me an update about a bridge that's out or a trail that's new or something like that. And then I know which parts of the state I have to research because I can't rehike all 1,000 trails in Oregon every year. But this way I, I, I can rehike the ones that are changed. And it just costs me a, a book a week all summer. <laughs> Actually, that was it was a clever plan because originally people would write angry letters and emails saying this trailhead was moved two miles i spent all day i was so mad and i sent him a free book and they go wow I, uh, thanks i've never gotten a free book before i'm gonna start looking for more thanks. i wind up with this whole uh, unpaid army of, of scouts out there helping me but i, I see it as a collaborative project <laughs> yes by yourself on all these trails? Oh, my wife, Janelle, goes with me on most of them. But we plan most of the hikes so that there's sort of a halfway point uh, where you could stop at the lake. And she says, oh, I need to sketch this. Uh, and that's a, a code for you go on and hike up the mountain. I'm going to stay here and draw in my journal. <laughs> <laughs> so most of the hikes in the book have a, an easy option and then a, a longer one, too. So, it, yeah. Yeah. And there is one book that's just for creaky knees, and that's the Oregon Trips and Trails. I, I just cherry picked all the prettiest trails in the whole state and put them in one book, uh, mostly the easy ones. It also has you know, every hot springs and the bed and breakfasts and towns and museums and stuff like that. So it's yeah, maybe a fun book. I'll link them. Uh, but uh, the abandoned uh, Cape Blanco 
I, I tell this, the legend of Face Rock and all that. But for Flores Lake, that would be in the uh, Oregon Coast uh, uh, hiking guidebook uh, because this is a, a development where they wanted to build a, a seaport on a, a lake that they said all you have to do is connect it to the ocean and we'll be able to, you'll have oceanfront property and ships will steam right in. This is just south of abandoned. Then they actually, uh, they built a hotel and all this stuff, all excited, oh boy, Flores. And then they actually did a survey and found out that the lake was higher than the ocean. Mm -hmm. So if they built the canal, it would just drain the lake. <laughs> That's pretty much the whole story. So yeah. I can't include every bit of Oregon history, just like this talk. I, I just covered the highlights of the book and the book covers just the highlights of the, of the state's history. Yeah. One but if I can only do one hike, it'll be the one I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm, I'm, tomorrow, I'm going to Steigerwald Lake. Um, you know, in the Columbia Gorge, they had fires, they have permits and crowds and all this stuff on the Oregon side. But on the Washington side, they just opened a new trailhead to Steigerwald Lake. This is a nature preserve where they tore out the dikes along the Columbia River and let the river flood in. Um, and then built a, a trail network around it, built an artificial island. This is by Washougal, right across the river from, from well, uh, Crown Point, practically. Um, and it's free. And well, I guess you might, they might charge $3 to park your car. But um, yeah, that's where I'm going to work. Flat, easy, and as you said, no more than five miles. Yeah. All right. Well, thank, thank you all. You if you have more questions, come talk to me. Yeah.